The professional footballer turned businessman almost beaten to death. I remember just going, I have children, I have children, please do not kill me. The cold case murder of a mother of two, a dramatic new development. This could be the one breakthrough that they've been waiting for. And the emergency services under attack. Put down the knife! An exclusive investigation. Then we turned round and produced a revolver and told him he was going to blow his head off if he came any closer. Live for the next hour, this is Crime Watch. Good evening and welcome to Crime Watch. We are live for the next 60 minutes with the latest crime investigations, news and appeals. We've got dozens of detectives from police forces across the country all hoping that you can help to crack their cases tonight. I'm Sonali Shah, back this month with the latest updates on previous cases, including a great result for this thug who's been sentenced to six years for brutally attacking a postmistress. And I've got a fresh batch of wanted faces and CCTV for you to help with. And I'll be returning to the scene of a shocking murder to uncover how police caught a cold and calculating killer. He took from Simon's dying body a chain and a phone. He then callously made his way back to his car and left, uh, leaving Simon to die in that field. We begin tonight with the extraordinarily violent and life-changing attack on 52-year-old Adam Nichols. The former professional footballer was working all hours with his brothers, managing a designer clothes delivery business from an industrial estate in Essex. Adam Nichols and his three brothers run a delivery company from an industrial estate in Purfleet in Essex. They deliver designer clothing to outlets all over the country. I used to be a professional footballer back when I was 17, 18. Played for Ipswich, left Ipswich and went and played out in South Africa for two years. Then came back to England and sustained a bad injury on my knee, at which time my brother's business had sort of started to you know, get bigger. So I went and sort of basically started working with my brothers, which I've done to this day. It's our life. It's, we don't know anything else but the business. So it's the most important thing to us. In the last, say, three to four years, things have got very tough. And it's just been a very hard struggle. Come on. In recent years, to keep costs low, Adam has stayed on site overnight, acting as a security guard. Oh, I'll see you tomorrow. You will. His brothers would turn up with fully loaded vans around 4 p.m., ready for the next morning's delivery. It was January the 28th, so it was dark. Obviously, it got dark by half past three. Closed off, it, yeah, it was quite a cold night. Closed the door and just basically settled down for the night, made myself a cup of tea and um, basically put the telly on. <laughs> Within a second, two people put inside the van. In my ear, it's just Adam, get out of the van. You've got to get out of this van. I don't know where strength come from. Try to run. Just remember this blue light, a vivid, vivid blue light. They were armed with pepper spray and a stun gun. He didn't stand a chance. And I just remember being just 
the whole body, just people just like kicking me. And then the one from behind, that's when he said, where are the keys? Give us the keys or I will effing kill you. And I remember just going, oh, I have children, I have children. Please do not kill me. Please do not kill me. I have children. I was swallowing blood. And then they lifted me up. And that's when they started taping my face up. Once they started going around across my eyes, and then they come around across my nose, I just, they're not gonna stop. So I put my phone in my mouth, and then they went right across my face, and I was struggling to breathe. It's hard to, um, you know, to sort of like, get, get in the mind of, it, of someone of like, Yeah, it's, and like, your thing what it does me is like I said, even when I was saying, and it wasn't to, it wasn't to stop, it, it was, I was going, I have children, I have children, please do not, don't, please don't kill me, I have children, I have children. Yeah, didn't mean a thing. Adam managed to crawl under the camper van and held on for dear life, but the attackers didn't stop there. I remember them trying to, they were grabbing my feet and they were trying to drag me out from underneath, but I was just holding on for dear life. And that's when I felt them stamping on my feet. It all went quiet. And I remember laying under the man for about five minutes, which was the most scary, you know, it was the scariest time for me. Because I couldn't see, I couldn't get the tape off my face. And then I just made a conscious decision that You've got to get, get you know, Adam, you've got to get from under here. You know, didn't know if they'd gone. And so I did. I just crawled out from underneath it. By this time, they'd stripped me of my clothing. I just, from memory, that I knew where the warehouses were that side, and I knew that if I went so far down, you come to fencing, and right at the beginning of the fencing, there's a gate. <laughs> Um, well, I'm, I'm in a lorry parked up, and there's a man here with no clothes on. Someone has tied him up with all black tape. He's just saying, help me, help me, help me. One part of you thinks, would it have been easier to give them the keys? But then I think he would have lost his livelihood. So I know for the reason why he protected it. It was the shock of seeing how bad he was when he was laying on the bed in um, intensive care. The amount of violence, never ever seen anything like that before. And his face was, couldn't recognise him. Yeah, you know, I've lost a sight of my left eye. My eye had been pushed back into my face and dropped. The socket that my eye sits in was totally shattered and my eye was only being held on in my face by the muscles. I have to drink out the right hand side of my mouth. From here, totally numb. All this part of my face totally numb, yeah. As brothers, we're, we're trying to think of this future, but also trying to think of our futures as well, so it's really hard. I don't know where it'll go. And I do worry about what will happen to Adam, the people, I can't, can't think what sort of people they are um, to do that to him. Never ever want to wish that upon anyone. You know, in my heart, yeah, if they would have killed me, they will kill someone, they will. And these people don't, don't they, they shouldn't be out in the streets. They should not be out in the streets. Well, he's right, they shouldn't. Let's speak now to DS Natalia Ross, who is leading the investigation. Totally shocking levels of violence for any normal person to witness, never mind go through. You've got some CCTV you want to show us tonight. Just, just tell us what viewers are looking at now, would you? Yeah, this is CCTV from the entrance to the Ensign Industrial Estate. It shows Adam, who stumbled around 300 yards to get help. He's covered in blood with his head bound. 
Um, it was January uh, the 28th, around about 7 p.m. this took place. I mean, in a, a big industrial estate, would it, have, would it have been busy that night? There's a vast number of businesses on this industrial estate. Uh, at the beginning of the industrial estate is the Scania Lorry Park. We'd expect lorry drivers to use it regularly as a rest stop, and we urge any lorry drivers that were in the area that night to contact us. As we heard in the film there from Adam's brother, Mark, these guys didn't get what they came for. No, despite subjecting that Adam to this ordeal, they didn't get what they came for. They used a stun gun on him and CS spray and caused him severe injuries. Um, Adam did say that he thought one of them distinctively had an Eastern European accent, which he felt might be important as well. Um, they used a stun gun, a gun um, they used pepper spray, as you say, and you've also got some more CCTV of, of a car that you think might be important. Tell us about this. We're keen to hear from anyone that might know about this car it's seen driving onto the industrial estate near to his camper van and leaves again shortly afterwards. We're keen to know who the occupants are. And just briefly, there's a reward here. Yeah, the charity Crime Stoppers offer a reward of up to £3,000 for information leading to a conviction. OK, Natalia, for now, thank you very much indeed. Really a horrific level of violence. You saw us. Just look at what these men did to Adam. They are dangerous. As he said, they need to be caught. If you can help in any way, please call the number 0500 600 600. Remember, if you've been a victim of crime, you can call the victim support line on 0808 16 89 one. A roundup of the latest crime news now, and detectives want your help in identifying this woman caught on CCTV in Westminster in London earlier this year. At around 3.30 p.m. on Tuesday, the 24th of February, she asked a police officer for access to a highly restricted area but was refused. Detectives believe this is the same woman seen on a nearby CCTV camera at around the same time. Ten minutes after her first approach, she returned to the secure area but again didn't gain admission. A scarf police believe she'd been carrying was later found on a nearby wall wrapped around two large knives. If you think you might know who this woman is, please call on the usual number. Police in Manchester are continuing their search for a gunman who shot dead a well-known criminal outside his home. 55-year-old Paul Massey, once branded Mr Big, was found in the Clifton area after reports of gunfire on Sunday evening. Witnesses say the masked gunman was white and wore military-style clothes and a fisherman's type hat. Massey, a father of five, was interviewed in 1998 as part of a BBC documentary which never aired. It's like myself, you know, I could be shot dead any time. I've, I've realised that for years, but it's meant to happen, it's meant to happen, and that's the end of it. Police believe it was a targeted attack and are appealing for witnesses, including the driver of a silver or grey Volvo and a teenage Asian girl who was seen in the area to come forward. Get in touch if you can help. A 78-year-old man who plotted to set up a crystal meth production line likened to the TV series Breaking Bad has been jailed for 18 years. George Rogers, who was convicted of conspiracy to manufacture and supply drugs, was sentenced at Bristol Crown Court yesterday, along with eight other men, including a self-taught chemist. The trial heard Rogers, who, like the lead character in the American TV show, has cancer, masterminded the plot from behind bars. But the plan was stopped after undercover police bugged their cars. This footage shows them gathering for one of their meetings. The rest of the gang face a total of 66 years in prison. Police say elderly career criminal Rogers had been aiming to set up a drugs empire. A convicted criminal who was released in error from prison has been posting pictures of himself on social media. 34-year-old Ryan Byrne, who was serving time for burglary and robbery, was an inmate at Wandsworth Prison in London. Here he is, pictured holding a pint in a pub. He's even snapped smiling next to a police van. Police have now released these custody images of Byrne in the hope of tracking him down. Anyone who's seen him should call us on the usual number. Each one of the many thousands of cases we've featured over the years begins with a call to the emergency services. But you might be surprised to know that assaults on those fire, ambulance and police teams sent to help us are far from rare. An exclusive Crime Watch investigation has found that there were over 18,000 assaults on police officers alone last year. And Martin has this special report. 
Put it down! Put down the knife! They put themselves on the front line. We're going to stop bad people from doing bad things, and some of them don't want to be stopped. To help us when we need them most. All right, they'll just start swearing on nothing. Punched, kicked, right. bitten, threatened with stabbings. Uh, I know someone who has been stabbed. But every day across Britain, the people behind our emergency services face violence and abuse whilst doing their jobs. One or both of us may not have ended up going home that night. On the 15th of December 2010, PC Paul Madden was on duty in Ealing, West London. There was every chance on the day that I could have died. Well, to be more accurate, I could have stayed dead because my heart did stop on several occasions. It immediately went from a normal day to this is going to go wrong somehow. I have to do it because it's my job and I'll be damned if I back down. But there's no way this ends well. He responded to a call for backup from colleagues concerned about the behavior of a man they'd stopped on a bus. Our car was parked literally right over there. He was standing pretty much where those phone booths are now. The man was John Paul Onyenechi, later described by police as one of the most dangerous in Britain. Immediately saw this man and recognized him. He's quite distinctive. I saw he had something in his hand and guessed it was probably something shot. He just lunged towards me, tried to wrap an arm around the back of my neck. The first injury I got was, was along the side here. Uh, it goes from somewhere back here to about here. Luckily, it sort of luckily got stuck in my spine for a second, which bought me some time. He then came back in. I mean, he was at this point about a foot away from me. I slashed across the throat, closed with him, tried to get him in a headlock. Uh, and that's when I got the third one down the side of my face. As other officers tried to restrain Onyenechi, they too came under attack. Unfortunately, another one of my colleagues got stabbed across the scalp quite badly, and a PC took the knife clean across the front of his stab vest, which luckily he was wearing, because otherwise that probably would have killed him. Paul sustained life-threatening injuries. He was only saved thanks to a retired surgeon who happened to have been nearby. I've been very reliably informed by a lot of the doctors at the hospital. If it hadn't been for what he did, I would have stayed very much dead that day. Following the attack on Paul and his colleagues, Onyenechi was sentenced to life in prison for attempted murder. Cases like Paul's are rare, but the abuse faced by our emergency services sadly isn't. It's a typically busy weekend in Birmingham, and the pubs and clubs are full. Paramedic Mike Duggan and his team are based in the centre to help with the increase in footfall and alcohol. It's a big, bustling, vibrant place to be on a Friday and Saturday night, but it's not without its odd problems. All right, don't just start swearing on that thing. We do occasionally have some less savoury characters who want to try and cause us personal harm. Do you take any medication for anything? For the team, handling aggressive behaviour can often come with the job. Two colleagues of mine have attended doing their jobs, stabbed by the patients they were looking after. I've suffered pushes, shoves, I've had my wrist break, strangled, and but I have to say the worst is being spat on. The sad thing is, we're ambulance service. We're here to help people. Latest figures show more than 18,000 NHF staff were intentionally assaulted in the year ending March 2014 in England and Wales. A Crime Watch Freedom of Information request also reveals over 600 firefighters were verbally or physically attacked whilst on duty in 2014 in England alone. As for the police, the picture is unclear, as there are currently no official national statistics. But of the 44 forces that responded to our request, figures suggest there were at least 18,186 assaults on police staff in the last financial year. The actual figure is likely to be far higher.
Whilst the statistics are definitive, we can now see firsthand exactly what police face on the front line, thanks to the use of body-worn cameras. Incidents like this appalling attack on Sergeant Kerry Lawrence of Hampshire Police can now be recorded and used as vital evidence in court. A body camera also caught the moment a routine call took a terrifying turn for PC Alex Prentice in Northamptonshire last year. We were initially called out to report of a domestic disturbance. Um, it didn't come in as a blue light emergency and there were no mention of any weapons. The males turned round to face both of us and he pulls out a, a sort of seven and a half, eight inch carving knife that he had concealed in his trousers. Put it down! Come on! Put it down! Put it down! Put it down! Put it down! Put down the knife! Put it down! It's not the first time that sort of incident's happened to either of us, but it's the first time it's been so close to the fact he managed to, to catch the outside of my kit. If it had been two or three inches higher, the knife would have gone into my neck. Because of the evidence that he managed to gather on the cameras, he was convicted at court, he took an early guilty plea, um, and he received a 43-month sentence. And it's not just knives our emergency services have to face. Last October, two officers from the Metropolitan Police found themselves in the firing line after approaching a man who'd made off from the scene of a crash. The man that was matching our description of the driver was walking on the footpath. As I challenged him, he turned round and produced a revolver, uh, raised his arm up and pointed it at my colleague and told him he was going to blow his head off if he came any closer. For that split second, I thought, well, what are we going to do here? You know, we, we're literally trapped between a transit van and a garden wall. And, and I just thought, I just need to do something decisive here. Mark bravely went to push the gun away. As he did, he was shot through the hand. If it had been a centimetre towards the left for the exit wound, then that could have travelled up the arm and into the heart, and, uh, and I wouldn't be here probably. It just goes to show that any routine call can quickly escalate into something completely different. Having a gun pulled on me as a result of a road traffic collision was, uh, yeah, took my breath away, and uh, I hope I never have to go through that again. Thankfully, gun crime here remains low, but the general threat to officers is ever-present. So could more be done to protect the people who are there to protect us? The fact that we know they're going into danger does not mean it's acceptable when those officers are assaulted. We must keep changing and developing the training and the education and the equipment. Uh, and I would welcome a clear national picture of the number of officers assaulted and the circumstances in which they're assaulted so we as the professional body can learn from that and be better at protecting officers on the front line. The NHS says assaults on staff are unacceptable. And here in Cardiff at the University Hospital of Wales, the security team are now also wearing cameras to help catch their abusers in the act. That really gives us a sense of what our staff members have to put up with when uh, we see that these people spitting at them, throwing punches at them, and the level of verbal abuse that they're receiving on a daily basis. Racially abusing the nurse. Why? So I'm telling her I can't drink. She's telling me I can. So what? You know, these people can be extremely aggressive, and we see that through the body-worn video. I'm gonna smash your mate. I'm gonna smash your Cameras are never switched on permanently. They do warn the person that uh, they will turn the camera on, and any footage could be used in evidence against them. You're on camera. Uh, you not attempted. If you come into the hospital and you're ill, or, then the duty care will be provided to you. But if you, you then become violent towards our staff members, we will ensure that you are prosecuted. When you work in the emergency services, every day can bring unexpected hazards. But for those who look after our health, our homes and our streets, it seems it's a risk they're willing to take. It's my way of life. It's, it's the only thing I really know now, and um, I, I can't see me ever wanting to change that. We have such compassion for what we do to help people. I think you have to look at the job that we're here to help, and we always will be. It's not what we get paid for, by any stretch of the imagination, but we all know it can happen, and I'd rather it happen to me than a member of the public.
Well, we spoke to the Home Office about the lack of a proper national overview of attacks on police and they told us they will work out the best way to measure the number of assaults on the police with the aim of publishing more robust and comparable information next year. Martin. Wanted faces now and first up is this man, Krzysztof Zalewski. He was due to stand trial in September for five counts of sexual activity with a 13-year-old child, but he never turned up in court. He was found guilty in his absence and sentenced to seven years in prison. He's 32 and has this distinctive tattoo on his left arm. He has links to Leicester, Glasgow and Poland. Next up, Police Scotland need your help to find Martin Hamilton, although he also calls himself Martin Sullivan. He was released from prison last year, but is now wanted back inside. He was 54 last week and is known to be dangerous, so please don't approach him. Just dial 999. Number three is 51-year-old Michael Ifeyan, also known as Michael Nwabwezi. He was released on police bail after being questioned in connection with the rape of a vulnerable woman. He was supposed to report daily to police, but has gone missing. He has links to London, Essex and Hertfordshire, and police believe he could be working as a carer. Finally for now is 49-year-old Lee Clark. He was jailed for life for murdering a man with a samurai sword in 2003 and released early from prison on license. But he's failed to stick to the terms of his release and is now wanted back in jail. Clark has numerous tattoos on his back and chest and is known to have friends in Thurrock in South Essex. If you're in the building trade, keep an eye out for him. He has links there too. We'll go through the rest of the lineup a little bit later, but if you know where any of them might be, please do get in touch using the numbers on screen. Right, still to come tonight, the potentially crucial breakthrough in the killing of Julie Pacey, found murdered in her family bathroom by her 14-year-old daughter. A well, full DNA profile that they've got can rule out a lot of people. They know who it's not. They've just got to find who it is. But first, this month's CCTV roundup, starting with a violent bank robbery in Somerset. It's lunchtime in August last year, and a shop owner is paying in her takings at this bank in Shepton Mallet. As she chats, a man walks in, armed with a knife. You can see it clearly here. He holds the knife to her throat, demanding the bank give him money. But this robber is in a rush. Shouting at the cashier that it's taking too long, he flees the bank empty-handed. He may have failed to get his hands on any dosh, but he terrified the customer and staff. Who is he? This quiet shop in Greater Manchester is about to become anything but peaceful. Two hooded men burst in and immediately launch a vicious attack on the shopkeeper, who tries to defend himself and his takings. Look closely. Police believe this is a machete hidden inside a sports sock. The other robber also attacks the shopkeeper, but his disguise slips. He eventually manages to get into the till and ignoring the injured owner also helps himself to cigarettes. Happy with their loot, they make their getaway. The shopkeeper suffered a cut to his head so severe he had to have surgery. Who are these low-life thieves? A man and his friends are outside a block of flats in Crouch Hill in London last month. As they're having a cigarette, these men run up the stairs towards them. One pulls out what police believe is a silver handgun. You can see it in his hand here. He demands that they hand over valuables. The men steal cash from the victim's pocket and rip his watch from his wrist. They then casually walk down the stairs where they're joined by another group before escaping. Let's call time on these gun-toting watchmuggers. Midnight feasts all round at a kebab shop in Purley in Surrey in September 2013. But the man in the check shirt isn't happy. He accuses the customer at the front of the queue of being disrespectful to his wife. Without warning, he suddenly jumps up and punches the man straight in the face. As the victim lies unconscious on the floor, his friends try to restrain the attacker, but he makes a getaway from the takeaway. Who is this thump-happy thug?
This man is walking a vulnerable couple to a bank in Western Supermare to withdraw money for heating repairs. The problem is, they don't need any work done. The man leaves them at the bank, saying someone else will be along later to pick up the cash. Sure enough, after 20 minutes, a second man joins the couple in the bank. He stays with them, even following them to the cashier's window. He waits while they withdraw 1,500 pounds of their savings. He then leaves the bank with the couple and their hard-earned cash. The work on the heating is never carried out. Can you name these despicable men? You can take another look at tonight's faces and CCTV by pressing the red button on your remote. And of course, it's all on the Crime Watch website. Call and text the numbers on screen if you can help. On to a case now from more than 20 years ago. The murder of 38-year-old mother of two, Julie Pacey. It happened at her home in Grantham. Crime Watch featured a reconstruction back in 1994, but that crucial call never came through. Well, tonight we can exclusively reveal that police in Lincolnshire have made a significant breakthrough and they hope that with your help they can finally solve this horrific murder. It's 21 years ago now, it's a long time to be free when you've committed this crime. It was groundbreaking, he said, we've got a DNA result. this could be the one breakthrough that, that they've been waiting for. Julie was lovely. I've known her from the age of eight. We were childhood friends, my parents and Julie's parents were friends. We used to go on holiday together, so we grew up together, really. 38-year-old Julie Pacey had been married to Andrew for 18 years. How's it going? They lived in Grantham with their two children, Helen, 14. OK, coming. And Matthew, who was 11. Matthew, tea's on the table. Be in a minute. She loved to be with the kids. And we're just a normal family, nothing special. Just run-of-the-mill, ordinary people. That's all we were. On Monday, 26th September, Julie went to work at around 10 a.m. She looked after children part-time at a local preschool. Julie left the nursery at around 2 p.m. She popped out briefly to the shops in the afternoon before heading back to the house. At 4.15 p.m., Julie's 14-year-old daughter returned from school. Her mum had been sexually assaulted, strangled and left for dead in the bathroom of their family home. The hunt was on to find Julie's killer, but with no obvious lead, detectives turned to Crime Watch. Let's start with the murder of Julie Pacey uh, in Grantham in Lincolnshire. I mean, some really very, very good information indeed. Yes, there are. We've, uh, I've seen uh, over 80 calls into the studio. Despite that large number of calls, the appeal yielded few results, and the frustrations for the family and the investigation team grew. Detective Inspector Helen Evans has worked on the investigation since the beginning. It's been 21 years since Julie was murdered, and for all investigation teams and senior investigating officers, the key most important feature is to identify who was responsible. We've never identified a motive. Julie lived for her family, she lived for her friends. She was very devoted to all of those very closely around her. Um, there's absolutely no reason as to why she was attacked. One person police have never been able to trace was a man seen in blue overalls near the Pacey's home. On the Friday before she died, Julie had a young girl come and stay at her house prior to her own mother coming home. 
As she approached the house, she saw a man dressed in blue overalls going onto Julie's driveway. As she got closer to the house, uh, she then saw this man come out of Julie's front door and she passed him on the driveway. And as she went into the house, Julie said, did you see that man? Um, and she said yes, and Julie explained how the man had rung the doorbell, come into the house, asked for directions, and she said, oh, you've got the wrong house, and then just, he left. On the day that Julie was murdered, there were sightings of a similarly described man in the area of where Julie lived. We don't know that the man in the overalls was the person that killed Julie, um, but it is very coincidental that two men with a similar description were at or near Julie's house on the Friday before she died and also on the afternoon that she was killed. 21 years passed by with no significant leads for the investigation team until forensic scientists made a groundbreaking discovery. One phone call would take the detectives closer to finding Julie's killer. He said to me, am I sitting down? And I said, yes. And he said, we've got a DNA result. It's the first time ever in the whole 21 years since Julie's death that we've had such a significant piece of information. This breakthrough has been down to a relatively new technique carried out by forensic scientists called DNA17. That technique is based on methods that were developed in the 1980s, um, but over the years that technique has been refined. One thing that DNA17 does is it allows us to produce DNA profiles from tiny quantities of DNA. Whereas before, we, we might need hundreds of um, human cells to produce a DNA profile, a good one. Now we only need a few cells. So what this enables us to do, and this is what happened in this case, is to revisit um, the case materials um, and to perhaps look at things that weren't DNA profiled during the original investigation. We knew that the forensic possibilities were there, but I can't really believe that we've got that information, that that profile is still there after all this length of time. It really does take us forward. We were highly delighted. I thought it was a big breakthrough. I think the, uh, the DNA profile, the full DNA profile that they've got can rule out a lot of people. They know who it's not. They've just got to find who it is. Julie was very close to her parents. Julie's mum died uh, not that long ago. Julie's dad is not very well now. He's got cancer. And whilst he's still with us, we just really love this to be solved for him as much as anybody else. Ever since the, the first day, I've always had hope that they would find somebody. They only need one phone call. That's all they need, just one call. Just one call. I'm joined now by Detective Inspector Helen Evans, who you saw in the film. Thanks for joining us. Um, I, you know, I said this was a landmark forensic breakthrough in this case. You don't think that's too much of an overstatement, do you? No, not at all. This is a really significant development for the investigation. Uh, the new forensic work um, has provided us with a, a new DNA profile of who we believe is Julie's killer. And I'm appealing tonight for information in relation to who that person might be. Right, so what can you tell me about this man in these blue overalls with it looked like sort of pretty ruddy complexion? Yes, that's right. Um, he was actually at Julie's house on the Friday. Uh, she died on the Monday. And shortly after she died, um, there were several sightings in the area of this dressed, uh, similarly dressed man who fitted the description of the man seen on Friday. Um, he's quite important to the investigation in terms of providing information about the distance between the two days. Um, he hasn't been traced. We are keen to trace him. Um, what I would add to that is that if it was him and he was genuinely calling at the house on the Friday afternoon for directions, um, then if he can make himself known and please come forward, we can eliminate him from the investigation. So important now that you've got that DNA. There was also a car that might or might not be connected with what went on that day. Tell us about that. That's right. Um, there was a blue BMW, possibly a 5 Series BMW, that was seen around the time that Julie died, parked on her driveway. Um, again, we haven't traced the owner of this vehicle, and if you do know something about this car, were you driving that car, then please contact us. Could be so important. And Julie's watch hasn't been traced since she was murdered. No, that's right. It's a very unusual watch. It's French. It's called 
uh, Luc Desroches. Uh, it was purchased shortly before D Julie died in France. We've never found it. Um, if you have any information that relates to the watch but can actually lead us specifically to her killer, then please contact us again. Yes, you, you know where it comes from. You don't need that information. No, that's right. Okay. Information in relation to the person. Uh, Helen, thank you very much for updating us then. I mean, a truly dreadful case, 20 year, 21 years on. With your help, hopefully tonight it can be solved. Please call now. It's the usual number, 0500 600 600. If you have got any idea who Julie's killer might be. Or, of course, you can speak anonymously to Crime Stoppers. They're on 0800 treble 5 treble 1. Right, still to come tonight then. How this grainy CCTV led detectives to a brutal killer. We concluded that it, it was practically impossible for the vehicle that was seen at that time to be any other than Wainwright's vehicle. But first, more wanted faces, starting with Christian Dorian Siwak. Detectives in Greater Manchester want to question him in connection with human trafficking offences. He has contacts in Bolton, Preston and Blackpool and is 24 years old. Number six is 23-year-old Jackson Brady. Officers want to talk to him in relation to a conspiracy to supply heroin and crack cocaine. Brady has friends and family in the Cheshire and Merseyside areas. Next is Winston Anthony Reid, although he also calls himself Malik Shabazz. Detectives want to question him over rape, blackmail and assault allegations. He's 52 years old, but sometimes claims he's 10 years younger. Reid has links to Northamptonshire, Norfolk, Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire and may be working as a personal trainer. And finally, we have 35-year-old Christopher Bunn. He was arrested in connection with offences regarding indecent images of children. He was released on police bail but has failed to return. Bunn has links to Brighton, Norfolk, Bristol, Ireland and Northamptonshire and is known to attend music festivals. If you know where any of the faces are, then get in touch using the numbers on screen. You can take another look on the Crime Watch website and they're all on the red button until midnight. Now we've got lots of updates on previous cases to tell you about this month, starting with our last programme, when we asked for your help after father of two, Tipu Sultan, was murdered in South Shields. The 32-year-old was shot dead outside the family takeaway. Well, following information uh, received after the programme, police made four arrests. Two men have since appeared in court, charged with Tipu's murder and are due to appear again in October. You may remember in April we featured the horrific rape of an 18-year-old girl in Leeds after she was snatched from a bus stop. The whole shocking attack was caught on CCTV. Well, earlier this month, 21-year-old Dzenko Turtak was brought to the UK from Slovakia and charged with attempted murder and rape in connection with the case. He's been remanded in custody to appear in court again in September. Now, in March, we appealed for help after Darren Pigeon was attacked with acid as he was sitting in his car in Rayleigh in Essex. He suffered 10% burns in the incident. Well, last month, two people were charged in connection with the attack and will appear in court again next month. Some convictions to update you on now. In July 2013, we showed you this CCTV of a terrifying robbery at a post office in Gravesend in Kent. Well, the postmistress was beaten over the head numerous times in the attack. You'll be glad to know that in April, this man, Daryl Patrick McNamee from Kent, was sentenced to six years and eight months after pleading guilty to the robbery. The other man in the CCTV is still outstanding, so please call in if you know who he is. Now, in January, we showed you uh, this man, Jason McLaughlin, who was wanted for an attack in Swansea in which a man was stabbed seven times and hit on the back of the head with a hammer. Well, as a direct result of the programme, McLaughlin was arrested and earlier this month found guilty of attempted murder. He's going to be sentenced in August, so a good result. And on the same programme, we showed you this man, Craig Johnson, or Craig Davies, as he's also known, who was wanted for numerous fraud offences where women were duped into taking out loans or mobile phone contracts. Well, thanks to information from a viewer, he was arrested and in May jailed for two years. As ever, it just goes to show that your calls really do make a difference. Early last year, we appealed for your help to catch the killer of Simon Holdsworth. He had been working around the clock to save for his wedding to his fiancée, Carleen, when, just a week before Christmas in 2013, he was murdered. 
Martin has been back to Sheffield to find out how traditional detective work and meticulous CCTV analysis enable police to catch his killer. I came to this field on the outskirts of Sheffield last year as police investigated the murder of Simon Holdsworth. The 36-year-old was attacked as he made his way home from work. With no obvious motive and little forensic evidence, detectives faced a huge challenge as they hunted for his killer. He was a very, very bubbly character. Yeah, very friendly. Um, he's He's a great person to talk to, great person to, to laugh with. He really took the role of, of being a dad, um, which was very important to me. Um, yeah, he was, he was a lovely, a lovely man. The couple had been working long hours to save for their wedding the following year. He was very good at his job. We was training him to be more of a team leader. You know, we felt he got potential to send the progress in the company. Um, that was because of his uh, personality, that we felt he could draw people and people wanted to respond to him. On the night of his murder, Simon had clocked off just before 11 p.m. He caught his usual bus to the playing fields near his house from where he always took a shortcut home. His body was found by a passerby early the next morning. Uh, Simon had multiple head injuries uh, that, that we believe had been caused by a weapon. There was no obvious sign of a struggle. Simon didn't present any defensive injuries. It's clear that, uh, that Simon didn't stand a chance from this attack. It was just numb, just absolute numbness. I, I couldn't take it in at all. Um, I still can't take it in now. You know, you still expect him to walk through the door. Simon's work colleagues were also in shock, but tried to help police as much as they could. Everybody brainstormed to, to try and remember what had actually happened, where they were, what people had said. Um, and we spent a lot of time as a group together chatting through this. Meanwhile, police were searching the crime scene for clues. Simon's gold chain and phone were missing. Had the killer stolen them? But their first break came from CCTV at the nearby school. This grainy camera footage from the night of the murder showed a car parking near the field. A blurry figure then walked in. A short time later, another person, now known to be Simon, also entered the field. This coincides with when he got off the bus. Chillingly, only one person was seen to leave. Police were sure this was the moment when Simon was killed. Could the driver of this car have been his killer? CCTV taken from a nearby bus showed a clearer image. Experts were brought in to find out more. From our initial blind analysis, we were able to determine that the vehicle was either a Mark IV Vauxhall Astra or a Mark V Ford Escort. It was obvious that the uh, headlights of the vehicle were not functioning correctly. Um, there was an unusual pattern on the road. Uh, it looked as if the lights were incorrect or damaged or misaligned or that some of the, the front lights were not functioning. It certainly appeared in all of the CCTV images that we looked at that either the, the same vehicle or, or a very, very similar vehicle was, was present in each case. Detectives checked the cars of everyone in Simon's home and work life. Only one person owned this type of vehicle. Sean Wainwright drove a Mark IV Astra, which had faulty tail and headlights. He'd been working with Simon at the factory for more than a year. 
we have a statement off Sean Wainwright. He says he leaves uh, before Simon and he makes his way straight home. Uh, a journey of a couple of miles, which takes him five or six minutes to, to complete. We check that out. And what we find is uh, uh, in a number of CCTV cameras that his vehicle is not there at the time that he says he is. Uh, we do get the vehicle arriving home 40 minutes after Wainwright says he is. Uh, that causes us to be really suspicious and, and look even more closely at Sean Wainwright. Police also discovered that Wainwright had been one of the first to visit the crime scene, even laying a wreath on behalf of the factory. In fact, he had visited the field no less than 11 times after Simon's murder. In January 2014, Wainwright was arrested and interviewed. I have nothing to do with the murder of Simon Oldsworth. Nothing. Okay. He was a very good friend of mine. A very good friend. And although the blurry CCTV footage suggested he might be the driver of the mystery car, the evidence wasn't strong enough to charge him. You've asked me the same question. He was released on bail while officers continued their work. Simon Holdsworth was looking forward to getting married this year. Still lacking the crucial evidence to prove beyond doubt who was the killer, detectives appealed for the help of Crime Watch viewers. That vehicle is of massive significance in this investigation. It's important that I trace who's in that vehicle and what that vehicle is. That CCTV footage would again prove critical. The image experts conducted a controlled reconstruction. Wainwright's Astra was among four vehicles that were driven past each camera. They then compared these images with the original footage. Having looked at the vehicle make model and the aftermarket features and a number of acquired features on the vehicle, such as the damage to the lighting, we concluded that it, it was practically impossible for the vehicle that was seen at that time to be any other than Wainwright's vehicle. Detectives could now prove Wainwright had been at the crime scene that night. But what had happened to Simon's belongings? During 16 hours of interview, Wainwright gave a detailed account of his movements. But he had missed out an important fact. And CCTV would again be his undoing. This footage shows him just hours after Simon's body was found, selling a gold chain that was later melted down. Wainwright had tried to cover his tracks by giving the shop a false address. We believe that chain was Simon's, and that's why he omitted to tell us. All the evidence now pointed to Wainwright, but what was his motive? The answer lay in the crucial witness testimonies from workmates. They said Wainwright had told them that on the night of Simon's murder, he tried to get back into the factory after forgetting his wallet. Employees who had worked previously with Wainwright also spoke of how he often used violence to settle minor work disputes. What do you mean by that? We know that uh, Sean Wainwright left. His car is caught on CCTV footage leaving work five minutes before Simon. And we believe Wainwright's come back and asked Simon to open up to get his wallet. Simon's a supervisor, and he said no, because he's going home. Now oh, forget it. Not liking that answer, uh, Wainwright has then driven the three miles or so to where he knows that Simon lives. Wainwright laid him wait. Wainwright carried out a brutal attack. He took from Simon's dying body a chain and a phone. He then callously made his way back to his car and left, uh, leaving Simon to die in that field. Last month, after a three-week trial, Sean Wainwright was convicted of the murder of Simon Holdsworth.
he will serve a minimum of 28 years. Sean Wainwright uh, revealed himself in our investigation to be a callous bully, and it's staggering that uh, someone could do that much damage to an individual over a petty work dispute. The horrific events of that night will never go away. No punishment can ever fit that night. And uh, Simon no longer being with his family or selves. It's still hard now to, to think that he's not coming back. Just got to remember him in the best way and remember him how Simon would want to be remembered, which is living life to the full, you know, enjoying life and and having a good home and a good family and working hard and he just he just loved his family so much and he'll always be missed always it's just such a sad case isn't it at least justice was served there it's time now for a last check on what's coming tonight on the phones here's martin Kirsty, we've had some excellent calls coming in. Let's start with that very violent attack on the industrial estate in Perfect. Remember Adam Nichols' battered face. Well, we've had a lot of calls, some good information has come in, but detectives need more information, particularly about the car that was shown in that CCTV footage. If we have information on that, that would be absolutely outstanding. The other appeal we showed you was on the murder of Julie Pacey. Again, some good calls are coming here, but we need a name. Who was the man in the boiler suit? If you have any idea if it was you, then please do call in. You could be eliminated from the investigation. And then on our wanted faces, the first one we showed you was Christoph Zelewski. Lots of good calls coming here. Police are chasing potential leads. And also, good calls on wanted face number three. Michael, if I in, again, some excellent calls. Please do keep them coming in. Thanks, Martin. That's everything for now, then. Please remember, do take a look uh, at the Crime Watch website. It's got all of tonight's appeals and the police instant room phone numbers. You can also have another look at the wanted faces and CCTV on the red button. That's going to be available until midnight tonight. Our phone lines, well, they'll be open until midnight tomorrow night. And we're going to be back with an update after the news tonight at uh, 10.35. We will, of course, also keep you up to date with the latest developments via Twitter. Follow at BBC Crime Watch. Thanks so much for all of your calls this evening. Do keep trying. If you haven't been successful yet, the calls really do make a difference from everyone here. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.